All right, we are live. Welcome, Door Grow Hackers, to the Door Grow Show. If you are a property management entrepreneur that wants to add doors, make a difference, increase revenue, help others, impact lives, and you are interested in growing your business and life, and you're open to doing things a bit differently, then you are a Door Grow Hacker. Door Grow Hackers love the opportunities, daily variety, unique challenges, and freedom that property management brings. Many in real estate think you're crazy for doing it, you think they're crazy for not because you realize that property management is the ultimate high trust gateway to real estate deals, relationships, and residual income. At DoorGrow, we are on a mission to transform property management businesses and their owners. We want to transform the industry, eliminate the BS, build awareness, change perception, expand the market, and help the best property management entrepreneurs win. I'm your host, property management growth expert, Jason Hull, the founder and CEO of DoorGrow. Now let's get into the show. And today's guest, I'm hanging out with the fabulous Gwen Aspen of Anna Quim. Gwen, welcome to the show. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited to have you. So it was really fun hanging out with you in the green room and uh, you were showing us, showing me your nerd glasses. So <laughs> that you just that I carry to... around with me everywhere I go. Cause there's always a need for, they're literally nerd gr glasses, you guys. They, they, they're from Hobby Lobby. I got them for an event I had to go to cause we were Revenge of the Nerds. And I bring yeah. them everywhere cause that's how nerdy I really am. But yeah, but, a lot of people. I mean, we can have fun too. That we can be fun nerds, right, Jason? We can, yes, maybe. <laughs> it's probably possible. So, a lot of people think I I wear all these weird, different glasses, especially like the orange ones. Like people notice I wear these orange glasses, and they they always come up to me and they think like I'm trying to be so cool. They're like, "Oh, why why are you wearing these glasses? Are you trying to be Bono?" And um, which is funny because Bono wears them the block blue light, right? So he's not wearing them just to be cool, but he is cool, way cooler than me. But I wear, <laughs> so then I go into this whole diatribe of like why I wear them and how they block blue light and how it helps like set my biorhythm patterns and helps me get good sleep. And then they're just sorry they asked. And then well, they that's realize your nerd shows, they are Jason. nerd glasses. So then they yeah, realize they I am Yeah, because they bring out your inner nerd when you wear them yeah. and people ask about them. Yeah, so I've got some less orange ones. Like these are my nerd glasses. So these make me look a little bit smarter. I think they look good. I like that so a lot. A little yellow to them. So, but all right, but I don't, I don't have the tape. So I'll have to get the tape and maybe add the tape at some point just to look more nerdy. So, so, all right, Glenn, so let's get into this. So tell us, give us a little bit of background. So you run this company doing uh, remote assistance from Mexico and you said they're not virtual assistants because they're not robots. Right. Okay. No, they're and, not. And you manage rent manager, the, the property management back office, you manage rent managers call center. So mm -hmm. you have a call center for rent manager people. We do. And then you also have Wistar group, which is a property management company in Omaha, Nebraska. Yes, that's all true. And so it all started. So my husband and I started Wistar group back in 2006. So this is not, and we've been doing this for a long time. And in 2008, um, a friend of his called him from Mexico because he lived in Mexico before I knew him for five years doing something totally different, transportation and logistics. Mm -hmm. And the friend called him and she said, you think the economy is bad in the United States? Well, you should come down to Mexico. Things are really bad down here. And I lost my job. Great. Is there any way I could work for you in some capacity from home? Because um, it wasn't only just a bad economy, but it was pretty dangerous at that time. And so my husband is the most loyal person you'll ever meet for better or worse. Okay. And so he, that's right when VOIP phones came out. So we sent one down to her, they figured out how to make it work. And she started answering the calls for Wistar group at the time it was called certified property management. And she's taking the calls and it works awesome. We love it. She loves it. It's great. So then we just started as we grew hiring all her friends for all the other jobs that we had. So, and we just operated like that because it worked for us for many years. And then in 2016, our friends from Boutique Property Management in Denver 
uh, we were hanging out with them and they're like, hey, this Mexico thing is working out great for you guys. Can you yeah. hook us up with some people from Mexico? And I was like, sure. So then I got them some employees from Mexico and they loved it. And then my husband and I were like, maybe we could help more property managers with this. And so it's just grown like wildfire since then. And now we have almost 150 employees in Mexico working for property management companies across the US and Canada. And it's just a win-win for everyone. And it's just so exciting. And I love my job so much. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. So, I mean, this sounds very similar to uh, Mark and Ann Lackey, who we had on the show, and they, except they do the the thing in the Philippines. And so it sounds like a very similar sort of etymology or story behind, you know, how you got into this. And it really was filling your own need and, and starting by helping a friend. And then it grew into helping all these different property managers. So that's the interesting thing I've heard from those that have Mexican staff is that um, they hire one and then all of a sudden all their family and friends start becoming <laughs> team members too. And they yeah. start that. And so there's, and that must be a culturally sort of different thing, I think, with Mexico versus the Philippines is the, I think they're both very family oriented, but I think there's something about Mexico that they're like, hey, like hire my brother or, you know, hire this family member. And uh, they're connecting people. So. Oh my gosh. Yeah. The connections that they have. And don't we all love that? I mean, isn't that what life's all about is connections and taking care of the people that you love and that you know. And I mean, it's just yet another thing to love about all the people that I know in Mexico is just how much they care for one another and have each other's backs and then also hold each other accountable. So that's the other thing is that, I mean, we grow a lot through internal references of one employee to another. And if someone has a problem and they were the one who referred them, man, they hear it from the other employee. So it, it's, it's been an interesting, um, I mean, there aren't that many cultural differences, but that's been kind of a fun one. Um, and it really ends up keeping the turnover really low because they're happy to work from, our employees work from home. Um, and they love it. And it, that's a huge advantage. Um, and, you know, they have these great connections with each other. And we, we have Christmas parties, we're going to have a summer picnic with everybody. Um, and it's just, it's been, it's added a lot of richness to my life, just getting to know the employees well. So, yeah, I was going to bring that up. So I, uh, a, a while back, I read a book called First Break All the Rules, and I believe it was put out by the Gallup organization, you know, that does the polling. And they did a whole bunch of surveying companies trying to figure out like what um, makes a really good, you know, team and what creates retention with a team. And one of the number one indicators of retention or whether somebody was going to stay with the company was whether or not they had a friend in the business. And, or you know, or somebody that they were connected to uh, personally in the in the you know, on the team, and so um, so that makes a lot of sense. That it increases retention so significantly. And I would say that that's our job. Like if we're going to hire someone remotely, um, if we're the manager of this person, it's imperative that you get to know them as a human being to get that retention and to get that buy-in and to get them you know on your same mission, going the same direction. So I believe, you know, I feel like I know you much better right now just because we're in a Zoom conference and yeah. that now doing we're totally webcam. Homies yeah, now we're, we're homies. Zoom. And we have the nerd classes together. I mean, so just the, those little things add to the relationship. And so if you make a point to, I only communicate with people from Mexico using webcam because yeah. we have this amazing connection then. And um, we feel like we know each other better. And so if you use webcam, I swear it makes all the difference in getting buy-in from a remote employee. I absolutely agree. So much so, I mean, I've done a lot of remote hiring in the past and there's a huge difference, but it got to the point eventually where I actually have a policy in our company called the webcam policy and everyone's required to have a webcam to be on the team and to communicate and show up and turn on the camera when we do meetings because it ended up being at one point i remember showing up having team meetings and there's like five to ten people without their webcams on and there's just me <laughs> putting on the I show love you know, really that. so i don't yeah. have an official policy but i'm now that you said it, i'm adding it 
But I also had, I have another employee who's from a totally different industry and he did a lot in banking and he was told to never have his webcam on. So it was such a cultural di dissonance when he came on the team because we're like, put your camera on. I can't see you. I don't know what you're doing. Like, I need to see you. Yep. And it was hard for him. So it is good if you're somebody who requires webcam to state it at the beginning because yeah, some people, it, is, it takes them a while to get used to it. Yeah, it is part of my onboarding process that they have to review the webcam policy and read it. And um, do you want me to tell you some of it here? Yeah, uh, I think right. it's important. I think it's so important because whether you do remote employees from Mexico, whether you have someone just like in the Midwest, I mean, you know, a lot of people hire people from rural Nebraska to work for their company because it's a lot less expensive. All right. I'm going to share an internal Understanding the power of a webcam is crucial for the relationship working in my in my opinion. All right. So here's our webcam policy for those listening. We are a team founded on the values of trust and transparency. It is important in a virtual team to be able to see one another on our virtual meetings since we often cannot meet directly in person. As a team, we don't care about your hair, makeup, clothes, etc. during internal meetings. Just be there. Not having a webcam during virtual meetings can feel like talking with someone behind a reflective window. It causes humans to try to assume and guess too much because they lack nonverbal cues we have evolved to rely on. Why address this? And then I bullets. To promote an environment of trust and transparency, to improve the efficiency of company communication and shorten meetings by effectively communicating with the full spectrum of verbal, facial expression, and nonverbal cues, to reduce multitasking, right? Because they cheat, mm. like they're like, oh yeah, I'm listening. Right. Oh, totally. Lunch. To reduce the anxiety of those speaking on camera. And then I have heading the expectation. It is expected that all team members will join Open Potion, that's our corporation, virtual meetings on video in order to fully engage in team and one-on-one -on -one meetings. This promotes collaboration on multiple levels and allows for each individual to feel heard as they see and receive nonverbal cues from their peers. This also increases productivity and reduces anxiety as ideas are better understood when they're coupled with facial expressions, gestures, and other forms of nonverbal communication. When when meeting with clients, we appreciate you doing your best to make yourself and your background presentable, but that is not required. We just want you fully present and visible. And then I have a quote and it says that the most important thing in communication is hearing what isn't said, unquote, Peter Drucker. So. Oh, I love it. I love all of it. Go. Although I would push back on the not caring what you look like because I have had people show up. <laughs> Not very often, but I had a guy, it was, and it looked like he had just been to the club and just like rolled out of bed. And I was like, man, and also you have to know your audience. So we do do, we have a uh, screenshots and keystrokes that we record of everyone that's working for us while they're working, not when they're not. And we had one uh, guy who was on a webcam conference and he had his hat sideways and my assistant was like, is that okay? Because it's not okay in certain, like if you live in California, that might be okay. But like if you're with an older team in Omaha and you have your hat on sideways, it just might not work. And I was like, no, it was, it's, they're in California. It's totally fine. And she was like, oh, okay. So you kind of yeah. have to know your audience, you know? I think it all boils audience. down to what the entrepreneur wants though too. So you, you before the call, I had asked you what your Myers-Briggs type was, and you're an ENTJ. So you've got that J at the end. So, so you're I'm judgy. Care. It means I'm you're, judgy, yeah. right? Yeah, you're judgy, <laughs> which means you're like a planner. You want things done a certain way. Like like these details matter to you. I'm a P, so I'm, I'm, I'm all over the place. So um, yeah, and I'm a bit more open-minded, and I love taking you Js and cracking you open a little bit to expose you to some things you weren't exposed to before. I, I so. need people like you in my life, too, because I can be, like, too in the box, and it's so nice to have that Js fresh Js have a box, for sure. Ps have no box, and Js look at us like we're crazy. They're, we're crazy. So <laughs> some, some of us, some of the Ps are that are perceiving, that's what the P stands for, um, they will take in things from all different sources, all different ideas. And to most Jays, that's being so open-minded, their brain is falling out is how Jays kind of view us sometimes. So, but yeah, we need each other, all these, all these different types. So 
I definitely need Jay's on my team to run my email, <laughs> handle my calendar, do all the planning stuff that is not fun for me. So, yeah. So, all right. So, uh, so you do this virtual team thing. How does, how does this, how does somebody start with you if they come to you and they're like, Hey, Anna Quim. And uh, first, where did that name come from? What is it? What does this name mean? Okay. So I'm going to give you the, the real, the real answer. So we used to be certified property manager management and then okay. Iram wanted to sue us because they're like, we have a certified property manager uh, distinction or whatever uh -huh. designation. And so we were like, oh, well, we wanted to rebrand anyway, because we started from nothing and took any piece of garbage that had a roof on it. And then, you know, as time went on, we became more sophisticated and wanted to take on nice, nicer properties. But in the local market, we were, you know, the low end. So we were already going to rebrand. But we didn't want to get sued or the, you know threatened of a lawsuit again. So we were like, oh, we have to have something that's totally unique. Well, if it, it's very hard, you guys, it's so hard to find something completely unique. Yeah. Um, and so Anaquim is my husband's a pilot for fun, and so he loves this airplane called Anaquim, and it means Mako shark in Portuguese. And so anyway, that was like a word that we could use that was like unique. So we got Anaquim and then Wistar Group. Wistar is my middle name. And they were unique enough that my best friend, who's a patent attorney, approved them. So for better or worse, we're Anaquim and Wistar Group. There you go. All right. <laughs> the Ma Portuguese Mako Shark. <laughs> it's also an airplane. Which you has got his, nothing his... to do with Mexico whatsoever. <laughs> no, but I'm not going to get sued for it. So, you no, know. No, it's perfect. So, I mean, it's a, it's a unique and original name, which is helpful in branding, right? So, mm -hmm. um, okay, cool. So, so now how does somebody get started with you guys? So somebody comes to you and they say, hey, I've got a problem. How do you know that that, that you can help them? Because I'm sure there's clients that you don't take on. And there's there clients are. that in aren't fact, a good fit. There were two clients yesterday that called me and I was like, you know what? I think you guys just need to wait for a minute. So, and that is my thing. I'm not going to, we don't sell. We try to make a relationship because if I sell you and then it doesn't work for you, then it creates a lot of heartache and drama for me because I'm, Empire I want the person in Mexico to be happy and, and I want the person in the United States to be happy so, so what happened yesterday was these one guy was buying another company and they already had two employees there, but he hadn't really worked with them yet. And I was like, mm -hmm. mm. and his, he only had three, he was going to be managing 400 properties. And I felt like his people count was good enough for 400 properties. So I said, just take on these two new people, mesh your processes and procedures together make sure it works. And then when you get a handle on them, then call me. And he was like, okay, that's a better idea. That's what I'm going to do. So, yeah. so I won't, if you call me and it's not going to work for you, I might tell you to do a few things first. And then the other guy called me and I thought, again, his, his head count was already too high. <clears throat> so, um, and I thought he could make some more efficiencies in his software because a lot of people only use like 5% of the software that they have purchased. And so if you have, you know, five really expensive employees and 400 units, I kind of think you should work on being more efficient first with your software and then call me. Yeah. So, right. I mean, unless you're going to transition things, but these were obviously longer conversations. I'm giving you the shortened version. So if someone calls me and they're like, no, I need somebody, I'm, I'm working my butt off and I need some relief, um, then we'll talk about a job description first because I need to find the right person for this role. So I need to know what kind of tasks you want. So for instance, if you want someone to be t doing a lot of cold calling, then that's going to be a different person than someone who's going to be helping you associate the right invoices with the right property and the right owner, right? So we have to make sure we have a good job description. Also, your training is going to be better. It's going to be a smoother onboarding process if you are really clear about what your needs are. Now, a lot of people will call me and they're just overwhelmed and they'll be like, I need a personal assistant. 
a lot of the times I push back on the personal assistant and I say, well, why do you need a personal assistant? And they'll be like, I just hate taking the phone calls. I'll say, okay, well, let's find someone to take your phone calls. Really, if you want a personal assistant because you're overwhelmed, think about the things that you hate doing that don't bring you joy, that don't fill you up. And let's give those to someone who's a better fit for those roles. So that loves doing those things. So usually it starts with a conversation about what the pain point is and what people really need and who they already have on their team and what software they're using. And we come up with a plan that will actually help them get what they want. So that's kind of my goal. I, yeah, and it, it may be me, it may not be me, but my goal, because I come from the property management ro- world, is just to prevent burnout from whoever's calling me whatever that looks like. Yeah. So you're helping them a little bit con Marie their time. Yes. Oh my gosh. Everyone has so many conflicting. (laughs) Well, I love that. Maybe I should use that, but um, you know, you have so many things that you have to do. Some people are coaches and that's really important to them and their property managers and they have families. And so Mm -hmm. your time is your time and attention are two of your most important resources and we need everyone on your team needs you to be do, using those wisely if you're the one steering the boat. So, yeah, I'm a big fan or proponent of energy management over time management. And yes. really identifying what energizes you as an entrepreneur versus what drains you, because we really, if we're doing the things that energize us, we have an endless amount of energy like our life and our business like fills us. But if, it, if we're doing things that drain us, it can, burnout sets in and it's inevitable and it becomes really difficult. And so I think it really is important for people to pay attention to the, their time and what really is giving them momentum. And anything that's, and I tell property managers all the time, like anything that's been sitting on your to-do list for more than a few weeks, you're probably not the person that should be doing it. Like, let's be honest. Right. Absolutely. And so there are people that are like you and I were just talking about how our personalities are different. So find someone who you like working with, who you enjoy spending time with, because it is an actual employee, you know, an employee essentially just Mm -hmm. living far away that complements you and can do the things that you struggle doing. And so that's kind of um, our role is to help people do that. Um, And so we also train them on the first day. So I have very high anxiety. Uh, So I take care of things that make me anxious. So I always go over the four ways people can die in property management on the first day. So carbon monoxide poisoning, natural gas explosion, fire, and a technician being mistaken for an intruder and getting shot. And the importance of asking for permission to enter. So those are four things that we go over, which is really funny because when we turn over the training to the client, um, my assistant will always be like, so what did you learn in training? And they're like, how not to die in property management? And the clients are like, what? I mean, I told them that we were going to talk about that with the agents, but people forget yeah. and they're like caught off guard. Um, but four, also four fair house, four ways to die. <laughs> um, but it really, I mean, those are really, really <laughs> important. Um, and it really does happen in our industry as there have been a number of deaths that we're all aware of. Um, and so it's really important whether you're going to hire someone remotely or not to really discuss, you know, what, what bad things can happen and how to make sure they don't happen right. um, in the onboarding training. Um, the other thing we cover is Fair Housing and American Disabilities Act. And, you know, that really should be trained every year. So um, if, if that's not on people's schedules for training, uh, domestically, I don't do this with the remotes, but domestically at our property management company, the other one is sexual harassment prevention training. So we have people who, we have a 70-year-old sales guy, and then we have a 21-year-old front office lady. So when you have multi-generational employees, especially what they think is appropriate is totally different. So it's important <laughs> to discuss that. 
Um, <laughs> because people aren't trying to be jerks and they're not yeah. trying to be bad people and they're not trying to offend anyone. It's just that what was totally appropriate in 1950 to talk about in the workplace is different. And also on the 21 year old side, I mean, 21 year olds sometimes think everyone's their best friend and they're hanging out at the bar and it's not true. So, right. you know, having that conversation at the beginning of a relationship with any employee is important. Okay. So Fair Housing and Disabilities Act, sexual harassment training, and four ways to die in property management. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And if you're going to be using webcam, here's another thing. I did have a client who thought it was totally appropriate to train his new employee without any clothes on. So word to the wise, keep your clothes on <laughs> if you're going to be yeah. training somebody. So people yeah. sometimes just don't know. They just don't so, know. I'm sure he was hot. It was summer. Maybe went out to the pool, came back, but it was like really not okay. So it's another right. thing to keep yeah. in mind. Paul, policies <laughs> improve over time. So you know there's something interesting if my webcam policy says don't be naked. So it doesn't <laughs> say that yet. So we haven't had that come up yet. But um, yeah, if that if it does happen, then we'll definitely add that in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had no idea that was going to be an issue, but. Right. You never know until it happens. And I think that's how all of the property management contracts evolve over time. Like, oh, right. well, this was a weird new situation. Let's avoid that in the future and write yeah. that into our contract. <laughs> okay. So somebody comes to you, you start them with some of these things. How are you vetting these um, Mexican employees, these team members? What are some of the things that kind of you go through to ensure that you're getting a good match, that you're finding somebody that's really a good fit for a position? Um, help those that are listening feel safer using Anaquim to find them a team member. Sure. Well, the first thing is that they have to fill out an application and upload a video of themselves speaking in English about their hobbies. And you find out a lot about people when they what they think is appropriate in a video to say about their hobbies and how good the English level is. Um, so those are the first, and it also demonstrates that they have some technological ability because you have to upload a video. Right. So we get rid of a lot of applicants right there. If they make it through those two steps, then we have them take a personality test. Um, we use the culture index. And the culture index indicates whether people have detail orientation or not. Generally speaking, unless I'm finding, unless I'm hiring for, you know, marketing position um, or outside sales or something, we're going to need detail orientation. So, mm -hmm. so we look for that. There are a few personality types that we just don't hire um, at all. And we also have a logic emotional continuum. So anyone who's really low on logic also gets um, not passed to the next level. After that, then they undergo, um, if they make it there, then they do an initial um, interview. And it's a pretty tough interview and ensures that they have the qualifications and the seriousness that we're looking for. Generally, the pool of candidates that we're looking for have worked previously for large corporations. So in the towns where we primarily source our candidates, um, they work for Nissan or GE or Hewlett Packard mm -hmm. or Tata Consulting. And there's some really big names where they've already gone through a lot of the training that you would need to train like a brand new person on, but they've already been through it. So they know how to talk on the phone. They know how to deal with conflict in a professional manner. They know how to write an email. So we do benefit from all that corporate training. Many of our folks have already been through. Um, okay. And so then if they make it through the interview, then we're going to start looking at their um, calling their references and just make sure that those show up um, well. After that, our clients, if they've made it through all the interviews, we've decided this person is worth this amount of money. So we have a pay scale based on, you know, education level, work experience, and we know what kind of jobs that they would fit into. Then we match them with the clients that we have who are looking. And so the clients get to look at 
three different candidates and, you know, see if this is a cultural fit for them. And if this is someone that's going to work on their team and that they're going to feel comfortable with on a day-to-day basis. Um, and so we always do the, the interviews in threes. So hopefully we do our job well enough. And then the first three, you know exactly who you want. But if you want to do another round, you know, our job is to make sure people are happy with their candidates. So the one negative about working in Mexico, and this is going to be with any country that's, I don't know, a lot of the countries that you would source from, background checks, I mean, it's not the same. You you can't, there's no government database. And even if there was, it probably wouldn't be accurate in the way that you and I would expect. Mm. So there's no background check policy. I mean, or way to even do that if you wanted to. So we rely a lot on internal references and those networks where people want to give us their their best friend and then they kind of internally hold them accountable as well. Yeah. So um, we haven't had any issues with it, but I would suggest with anyone working remotely, you manage your um, your privileges and your your software. So Rent Manager allows me to obscure uh, social security numbers, credit card numbers. And we have a policy that nobody working from home has access to those. And you have to be in the office, um, if you're going to be taking credit cards or looking at social security numbers. And so if you have good tight, um, privileges, you don't really have much to worry about by hiring someone remote. Um, and it's just a good policy anyway. So, yeah. All right. So that is kind of the matchmaking process. Mm-hmm. And then once you, they, they pick a candidate, how does, what's the transition like this onboarding sort of process and how far does Anaquim get involved to make sure? Cause I know some, some property managers are probably not used to having a virtual team member. They are probably going to make some mistakes. They might just say, Hey, this virtual stuff doesn't work. I don't get it. So how do you kind of ensure that transition is going to be healthy? Well, first of all, we try to get a good plan on before we even get to that place. So we have documents on like ideal, ideal first two weeks of training and talk to them about what that process looks like and talk to them about their technology and what kind of phones do you use. And we recommend that you listen to calls if you're going to have someone who's the face of your company and you're not going to be able to overhear them when you walk in the office. So here's a form on monitoring calls and here's a portal so you can see their screenshots and their keystrokes. And so we try to do all of that before the commitment takes place, like talk about what that looks like so that when the commitment, like, yes, I want to move forward happens, they've seen in their mind's eye and kind of have an idea what this looks like. We don't want for either the client or the agent to get to a place where it's the first day and they just look at each other in webcam and go, okay, what do I do now? Um, So we try to avoid that situation as much as possible, which is why we're not trying to hard sell anyone. We want someone to be committed to the process and feel, you know, somewhat confident. Obviously, you're going to be a little bit nervous if you've never done this before, but that's why we're here to hold your hand and give you that documentation and talk you through it um, so that you feel more confident before it actually happens. But then on the handover meeting, you know, so you're going to get them all set up on their computers. You're going to get them to know everybody in your office, take it, taking the laptop around. And you're going to say like, tell us something that people don't know about you or, What are you grateful for today? You know, a little icebreaker. And then, you know, you'll get into the tasks. Now, the great thing about working with Mexico is they're on your time zone. So do you have to be perfect? Do you have to have the perfect documentation? No, because you can, like any other employee that you hire, you can just say, okay, I'm going to show you how to do this. And I know it should be written down, but it's not. But you're going to help me write it down because I never had time to do this before. So here's the software where we're writing it down. Here's how you're going to get a screenshot using Snagit. And I'm going to video record myself going through this process and then make it a pretty process for me. And then when it's done and it's all pretty, then you're going to do it. So, I mean, that's possible. Um, Some people are further along in their processes and procedures than others. But by no means do you have to have things perfect to move forward with a remote assistant. 
Yeah. So the Myers Briggs people with J's a lot of times get really caught up in things being perfect before they move forward. They're like, I have to have every process documented before I could grow my business. You know? No, I mean, um, that's not real world. You know, I always say progress, not perfection. Right. And I mean, if, if you, you have to move forward, I'm reading this great book called the billionaire coach or the trillionaire coach, I think is what it's called. It's really good. It's on my audible right now. But the guy's like, okay, once you kind of have things down, you have to go and you have to go fast. And I think that sometimes the people who are really into perfection lose sight of go, go fast. And so it's always that balancing act. But um, I mean, if you're not good at processes and procedures, then hire someone to help you do that and, and just show them on in a video and say, okay, so for the next three hours, you're going to write this down. Okay. And then I'll check in with you in three hours and see how you're doing. And that's yeah. totally okay. It's I, I like that progress over perfection. So what I teach clients is done is better than perfect. Uh, so Ooh. it's very similar. So I say it done is. is better than perfect. Like get it done. You can always redo it later. You can make it better the second time around, but having something is better than not having it. And sometimes, and uh, the other thing that I'll throw out there sometimes is that perfect businesses are out of business. So don't try to make everything so perfect before you move forward. It's the businesses that fail, that make mistakes, that rapidly prototype, that try stuff out and see what doesn't work. They're the ones that move forward faster. So, And when you have that hard day where things really did fall apart, then just go back to the values. Like, okay, it fell apart, but I'm shoring it up as a value, as a person with value. So what does that look like? So if you have your values strong and you're connected to them, then when you mess up, if you just go back to that, you'll be fine. Right. That's how I look at it, at least. That's the foundation is yeah. a really strong why and set of values for the business. That's what creates culture in a company. So, well, cool. So what are some of the questions that property managers ask you that I haven't asked yet? Some of the frequently asked questions, concerns, considerations? The main thing is the role. I mean, people just are like, okay, everyone's doing, you know, they'll say VAs, but I don't, I, and I know I should be doing it because I'm supposed to be way more profitable than I am right now. All right. Uh, but where the heck do I get started? So usually when people ask that, I just tell them because we've been doing this since 2008, how our company is organized because I do feel like we use remote labor as at, at a higher level, as high of a level as you could. I mean, you might mm. structure it slightly differently, but just to give people an idea, because the thing is, is in people's eye, mind's eye, they remember virtual assistants. They think I need my processes to be perfect. This is someone who can only do route activities, can't think outside the box. And all of that is not true. Um, these People from Mexico are can be, if we hire for it, highly educated. We even have some professors on the team. We have some attorneys on the team. Um, highly educated people who most certainly are capable of thinking outside the box. Um, I mean, Guadalajara, where we source a lot of the people, are it's the tech capital of Mexico. Um, and so, I mean, w when I go to the Christmas party in Guadalajara, people are speaking like, Spanish, English, French, Portuguese. It's like an international gathering, like any European city that you'd be at or anything like that. So so here's how we're, we're structured. We have 1,200 units that we manage. We have three customer service people residing in Mexico who take all the frontline calls. We actually call them solutions agents instead of customer service agents because their job is to provide solutions. So they don't just read from a script, but they can also talk to tenants about their statement and what it means and what this maintenance service issue, uh, maintenance charges for and help people break a lease, give them information about breaking a lease, changing, uh, roommates, tell them if they can have a puppy or not, like actually solve problems and give solutions. Then we have three, uh, and they also take all the maintenance service issues and troubleshoot. 
So the great thing is that you don't have a phone tree when you call into our office. You just get a person, which is really good customer service. Most property management companies that I call have a phone tree and then you still can't get a hold of anybody. So thinking about what the experience is of like an owner calling your main line and what that feels like may be important in many of the markets that people are in. So once someone takes their phone call, uh, any elevated issues will go to the assistant property manager. Let's just take a simple thing. It's not even really elevated, but like a service issue would we'll go from customer service agent, would we'll take everything from the service issue. Then it goes to what we call the virgin list. And uh, the assistant property managers review that. They see if, and we have three of those, by the way. So one for, for each property manager has an assistant who's a true assistant. And they look at all the service issues that come in and decide whether our internal maintenance team can handle it or if it needs to go to a vendor. If it needs to go to a vendor, then they're in charge of putting a budget on it and based on the contract and whatever the owner wants, and then assigning it to a vendor and then following up on that. If it goes to our internal team, then another woman in Mexico who's the maintenance dispatcher decides whose list it goes on out of the 15 maintenance people that we have. And her job is to manage those guys' schedules and make sure they're busy and make sure they have work and make sure that they're going to a place that makes sense. Um, and so then the other people that we have is accounting. We have two people in accounting and collections. And they don't just do accounting, but they also are like, why is this maintenance guy going to the store three times in a day? I mean, mm -hmm. he's like actually analyzing the invoices and saying this price right. doesn't make any sense. So we have two people there. We have a um, applications underwriter who does the applications in Mexico as well and a marketing person in Mexico. And I feel like I'm forgetting somebody. Anything I on think the that's sales it. BDM side? No, you know, so my market is we we get a lot of business just coming in the door. So we don't have a BDM. Right. We have some salespeople that are on like commission basis, but we don't mm -hmm. have an official BDM role. And we actually decided not to get one this year, which was weird because I was like, we have to, sales always pays for itself. But when we looked at the numbers in our market, it didn't make sense to get someone at that price point. So instead we're buying a, a company in a, another market and growing that way, but that deal's not totally done yet. Um, right. But yeah. So anyway, um, so those are the people that we have in Mexico. Internally, we have a front office lady, a leasing agent, uh, operations manager, a maintenance manager, and two. Right now, we only have two property managers. And then my husband runs the company and puts his fingers and everything. Um, so that's, right. it's pretty lean for 1200 yeah. units. It's a pretty lean shop. Yeah, that is, that's really lean. So, um, and then you have pretty decent process documentation, I would imagine as well. We're, we use sweet process as our, how is it where we house our processes and procedures and we're kind of obsessed with it. And the, yeah, we're, and we use, um, EOS. So we're using, you know, the traction book. We've been mm -hmm. doing that for two and a half years now and love it. So that's how we stay organized and set our goals and priorities and make sure that we don't get lost in the day-to-day -day tasks and know where we're going um, on a daily right. basis. Yeah, I think every business eventually as they evolve, they need a planning system, um, which you had mentioned EOS. And every business uh, also needs a process system, some play system for documenting processes and leveraging to use processes. Um, we use Process Street internally, which works out really well. And I us. like Process Street, but it's more expensive than Sweet Process. Probably. So it, it depends on, you know, what, what your needs are. So, but I would recommend looking at both and determining what's better for your organization. But yeah, I like both those systems a lot. 
And then every business needs some sort of communication system in the business as well. So as a team, we use like Basecamp as our kind of communication platform to communicate internally. And then you need a client sort of support and communication system. So a lot of people are using Help Scout or Intercom or, you know, one of these sort of knowledge based support sort of systems. So, and there's probably other systems I'm forgetting off the top of my head, but yeah, businesses uh, really need all these different systems in place. And once you have these systems in place, um, it facilitates and enables your team to really do well and communicate and, and understand where the company's kind of headed and get in alignment with your vision and your goals. And yeah, it's a, it's a big deal. Yes. There's a lot, there's a lot to to take on, but again, people don't have to be perfect. Because <laughs> yeah. when you say that, it's like, oh my God, that's so overwhelming. But um, it doesn't <laughs> one, have to. One thing at a time. Yeah. One thing at a time, yeah. <laughs> and that's well, why I cool. like EOS though, because it takes that overwhelming, you know, the, oh my God, we have 10 million things that we have to do this year. And it, it yeah. forces you to say, okay, how much energy do we really have? And what are the priorities out of my list of, you know, a million things that I'm going to do in these three months. And it actually helps you get more of that done than you would if you were just looking at the long list. Yeah, there's there's a lot of, so it has an etymology that's very similar than a lot of business planning systems. And most of every business planning system has like an annual, annual objectives, quarterly objectives, monthly, and these things are, you know, they break down. And mm -hmm. the idea is, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? So right. you take these elephants and you break them down into 90 day, 30 day, you know, and then even weekly uh, commitments as a team. And so, but most businesses, a lot of businesses don't have any sort of planning system in place. And so they're hitting zero objectives because they really don't have any uh, and there's no clarity around it and they're just winging it. And the entrepreneurs, they're crazy. So the entrepreneur comes into the room and says, changes every week. Hey guys, I've got this great idea. And they lob a grenade into the middle of the room, pull the pin and lob this grenade and walk out. And they're excited and pumped up. And the team are like, what are we going to do with this thing? So yeah. And so having, having those systems in place can be really helpful. Um, especially if you have virtual team members, because then yeah. it makes it a lot easier for everybody to be on the same page. And people historically have thought like, oh, we're going to do all this planning and then we'll tell them later what we planned. But I recommend having the virtual team members in on all of those meetings. Um, yeah. So, I mean, on a daily, here's one tip that has really helped us. You know, we have the three customer service agents. And so every morning at 10 o'clock, they meet with, um, you know, the operations manager and just say, oh, you know, this person's out of the office today. They have a dentist appointment at two. So, um, and it's whoever's birthday and our swing thought for the day is people can hear you smile. And so in the call monitoring, I've noticed that there's not been so much smiling on there. So let's keep that in mind for today. And, you know, today's contest for online reviews you know, we're still giving $50 gift certificates or whatever to anyone who gets an online review, whatever it, you, you have going on and just touching base for 10 minutes a day makes all the difference to someone who's remote. Um, and then when you have your weekly like EOS meeting, you know, include them in what you're talking about. If they feel included in the process and in your mission, People don't leave. I mean, we've had the same employees at Wistar Group for six, eight, I think nine, is it nine years? We have one employee. I think we have two employees who've been with us for nine years. Yeah. So, um, so that's the key to getting the virtual or the remote members totally immersed in your culture. Yeah. They need to be part of it, ironically, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, absolutely part of it. Yeah, I'm a big proponent of making sure that your team members are involved in outcomes instead of being micromanaged. Like give them outcomes and let them innovate and they will mm -hmm. you'll be surprised at what they can come up with. It might not be the way that you would do it. It might be better. So, and a lot of times as entrepreneurs, we think we have to have it all figured out. We need to tell our team members, here are the steps. You have to do this exactly this way. But when it comes to goal setting, 
goals are outcomes. Give them, assign an outcome to somebody, let them own it. And, uh, and I think you'll be surprised at the results that they can create. And uh, and getting your team all involved in it, um, if, I mean, I, some of those meetings have been really eye opening for me because I had my set of ideas. I thought this is how the whole world kind of looks, and then I went around and asked all my team members, "Here's this outcome. What ideas do you guys have that can do it?" And my graphic designer has totally different ideas than I would have. My head of fulfillment has totally different ideas than I would have, and so they bring this perspective. And all these ideas were really good. And I'm like, "Yes, we should do that. Maybe not that. That one's great, you know." And and I think you don't want to be the emperor with no clothes running a company. And that's how you do that is by allowing your team members to have a voice and be involved in the process. I love that. And actually, we teach a version of that on the first day training. It's from this article that you can get on the internet called Who's Got the Monkey? Okay. It's the number one reprinted article from the Harvard Business Review of all time. And I only came okay. across it out of massive failure years ago. Um, where right. I took my team members out to lunch and I thought they would tell me how much they love their job. And they were like, no, we don't love it. You guys never listen to us. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, what? And they're like, yeah, we don't even bring up ideas to you anymore. Cause you're never going to listen anyway. And I was like, oh my yeah. God, this is terrible. And so we got this, we, I found the article on the internet and then we came at, have a change management process and we ask our team members to own their ideas. So the first step is people come to a meeting and say, hey, not all ideas are good ideas, but here's my idea. And then that allows people to save face and be vulnerable and say what they're afraid to say in the meeting. And then they have to bring everything to the meetings, the, the subsequent meetings to move the idea forward yeah. so that the decision maker can just say yay or nay. Um, I mean, sometimes there have to, there's a little homework on the decision makers part, but try to make it as minimal as possible. And I, I take it from sales, like in sales, salespeople are always eternally optimistic and they think everything's going to close. Yeah. And so my way of determining if it's going to actually close or not is do you, do you, is your name on the prospects calendar for another meeting? And if it's not, then your deal is dead. Just black and white. If it's not yeah. on there, you can revive it, but you better get a meeting on there. Same thing with ideas. If there's no, if your name and this this meeting is not on anyone else's calendar, your idea is dead. And just know that. Because when people feel, um, when they they feel badly about their job, when they, they get vulnerable, they say it, their manager's like, oh, that's a great idea. And then they wait three months and nothing happens to it. That mm -hmm. really hurts morale. So giving them the onus, hey, if if your idea isn't, it's not moving forward if there's not a meeting. And yeah. having them own that helps give them agency over their idea. Yeah, I love it. Well, cool. So, all right. So let's wrap this up, Gwen. So I think this has been really helpful. I think we talked about some really cool ideas. I think hopefully some listeners are a little bit more open to having some team members that are not sitting in their physical office. And how can people get in touch with you if they're interested in learning more? Well, I'm on Facebook. And so if you want to, um, if you want to send me a message at Gwen W. Aspen, I'd love to meet with you on there. Additionally, we have a website, anaquim.net, and you can fill out a form. We'll get right back to you um, there. And, uh, or you can email me at gaspen at anaquim.net. Um, but we love to help people. And like I said, you know, if you just want to bounce some ideas off on how, you know, it, whether this is a good idea or not, you know, we can talk about your specific situation. Awesome. All right, Gwen, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Jason. It's been so fun. I really appreciate you having me. All right. We'll let you go now. All right. All bye, right. Gwen. Bye. All right, so there you have it. So check them out at anaquim.net. And um, for those that are listening for the first time or checking us out, we would really appreciate you subscribing if you're listening on uh, YouTube or watching on YouTube or listening on iTunes. And we would appreciate uh, if you're on iTunes, you give us uh, your feedback. We would love to hear your real and raw feedback and give us a review on there would be really helpful. Uh, especially if you like the show, we would love that. That gets us excited. And then um, 
And then make sure you get inside our community, which is doorgrowclub.com. And this is a Facebook group where you get to hang out with other property management entrepreneurs, all the door grow hackers, and, uh, and connect with us and see future episodes. We live stream these episodes into that group. And uh, so you won't miss a beat. And uh, check us out there, doorgrowclub.com. And if you are interested in growing your business, then reach out to us, doorgrow.com. We would love to help you and see if we can help you grow your business. So until next time, everybody, uh, to our mutual friends.